we're going to talk about is largely theoretical. And it's theoretical not only in what I'm proposing is sort of theoretical, but also we're going to talk a lot about theory. Um, I really like theory. Uh, I have a master's degree in history, and a lot of what you learn in grad school is historiographical theory, right? Uh, how historians do history, how historians look at history, how they deal with, with uh, interpretations and arguments from other historians and everything. That's what you learn in grad school, right? So, a couple years ago, I was translating a, uh, a biography of a guy named Gutz von der Lichten. And Gutz was a knight who was born in 1480. He lived until 1562. And he wrote an autobiography detailing his many adventures and feuds and fights and wars and stuff. And one of the things he kept saying when he would find himself in a dangerous situation was he would describe moving to a hill or trying to get to a tree line or something like that. And he would describe it as moving to his advantage, right? And this I clocked really early because it's something that Meyer says pretty frequently too, uh, just in a vague sort of way. He says, you know, and then from there, like at the end of a shook, he'll say, do this, do this, do this. And then from there, go to your advantage, right? So I was starting to think like, okay, so what are the, the, the advantage that Gauss is describing is pretty obvious. He's being chased by horsemen. He goes into the trees. They can't chase him. Cool. That's super contextual, though. It's not very useful, right? And when Meyer is talking about it, he's clearly referencing certain advantages that you're supposed to know as a fencer, right? So I was thinking, well, what the hell does that mean? What advantages is he talking about? Well, does he describe them explicitly? And he sort of does, but he also doesn't. Because what he does is he uses five words, right? So how many of you do German, uh, like study a German text tradition of fencing, right? We'll define all these, by the way. Um, Meyer very seldom references anything called the five words, but he uses the five words all throughout his entire uh, treatise. And in his many works, he talks about it all the time. And when it comes down to it, the five words are describing the only advantages that you ever need to think about in fencing. Right? And those two advantages are, and we'll get into more detail about it later, strength, positional strength, structure of your engagement, right, bind on the sword, uh, and threat. And that's four and nine. Right? And we'll talk about this again in a bit more detail. And I realized that if you think about what Gus is doing in the same way you think about what Meyer is telling you to do with sword, you end up in more or less the same place. Right? You end up with the same sort of analytical process going on to make sure that you are always acting to your own advantage. Right? And you're doing this in any conflict of any scale. The nice thing about this kind of a, as a theoretical concept is that it's completely fractal. Right? It works at every single level. It works at the level of individual combat all the way up to, as we'll, as we'll see at the end of the lecture, wars that involve millions of people. It works at every single level of that, right? And it's a really simple, it's really, like, this is like Cthulhu level, right? You, you crack open the book, and it gets in there, and now you've lost your sanity permanently. Because all you're ever going to think about is how everything that you do in your life, you can relate through the five words, right? Um, I play a... I badly play an extraction shooter called Hunt Showdown. And I use the five words when I play with my friends to parse what's going on because I know that they are fencers and they'll understand what it means, right? And that to me, the whole purpose of this is to make an argument that this concept is why fencing is still alive, right? This concept, the fact that we can we can apply it to completely novel things that Lee Schnauer could never have imagined, means that this is alive. What we're doing is, is part of a tradition that uses this theoretical concept to make sense of the world, right? And it's not something, like, we might need to add bits here and there to kind of understand certain exigencies of war, but for the most part, this is a really robust way to understand actions on the battlefield, actions at the strategic level, even actions that provoke wars or sustain wars or continue wars, right? Um, and I sort of wrestled with myself a little bit about how exactly to go about talking about this, and I, the first concept was basically like, I'm just gonna give you a billion examples of things but then I realized that's just sort of, you're going to come away thinking about nothing. You're just going to have this sort of spiky ball of history anecdotes, and it's not going to mean anything. Um, so instead, we're going to kind of go through some theoretical concepts. We're going to talk about what I think this stuff means. We're going to talk about uh, other kind of theories of military history. And then we're going to end by giving sort of a deep dive into using the five words to understand the First World War, right? And there's some really interesting things that tie in directly from uh, fencing theory to the theory of war that are going on in the First World War. So 
So we'll get we'll get there eventually. So if you have questions, feel free to fling your hand up at any point. I want this to be more of a discussion than a lecture. So if you have questions uh, and everything, just raise your hand, and we'll probably have plenty of time at the end. Uh, to, so any questions before we go on? Okay. So the German Marshall theory, right? That's Nietzsche. He did not invent the five words. He never says he invented the five words. He doesn't really say who invented the five words. My, uh, my take on this is probably that this is a fairly intuitive kind of intellectual process that way, way pre-existed Lichtenauer. He's just codifying it and applying it specifically to Petsky, right? Um, and what he's doing is essentially parsing a, a language of advantage that's, that's shared. When he's talking about the five words, when he's talking about everything, what he means is that you recognize that there are, again, limited physical realities that you can take advantage from. And if you know what those are, and you can you can consistently apply them, then you can fence really well. Because you know if you have to make yourself stronger, or if you are strong already and can go straight to attack. You know if you're being threatened, that you have to respond to it, you have to deal with it, rather than just launch your own attack, right? Uh, and obviously, we all, as fencers, know that it's one thing to know this, and it's another thing to do it, right? And it's another thing to know it and do it, and it's the third thing to do it correctly or to do it to your advantage, right? Because fencing's really hard. Guess what else is really hard? War is really hard. War is also super duper simple, and so is fencing, right? But it's it's trying to put all this stuff together and do it right all the time is what makes it hard. So this is, uh, a lot of this is largely based, especially when we talk about like timing and tempo, uh, a lot of this is based on uh, theories written out by ancient Greeks. So specifically like Aristotle, Plato, uh, they have all sorts of, uh, kind of theoretical concepts about physics. And people in the medieval period loved ancient Greek stuff. They read it all the time. They tried to, to spin it up and, and redo it and everything, right? So a lot of the way that we understand things are based on these ancient Greek ideas of paired contraries, right? Is anybody familiar with like uh, the four humors? Things like yeah. that, right? So the four humors are, are composed of two pairs of contraries. There's hot and dry, or there's hot and cold, and there's wet and dry. And humors are combinations of those that create fluids, and those fluids in your body create what your personality is, right? So I'm choleric. I'm very hot and dry. I'm, I'm relatively fiery. I, I, I want to be kind of in front of people talking a lot, <laughs> right? I like being in control of things. Um, and if I stub my toe, I get really upset. But uh, all of us will have those, right? And these are just kind of the ideas of it. This is a really simple way to just categorize people very quickly so that we can act act in concert with them or against them, right? If I know that you're choleric and I'm fencing you, I'm going to try to annoy you, because the more annoyed you are, the more reckless you'll be. And the more reckless you'll be, the easier you are to predict, and the easier I'll have to hurt you with my sword, right? So the pair of contraries that we have uh, in the five words are as two sets, right? We know strong and weak, and then we have four and not. Uh, or We'll kind of get into, again, the, the definitions of these, but generally you'll hear described as being before and after. Uh, I like to also think about a head versus behind, which is another useful way that actually makes more sense in studying war than just fencing, but it is still useful to know. But the thing to know is that if if I'm fencing somebody and our swords are crossed, one of us is stronger, unambiguously. One of us, you will never have a neutral bind. It's not useful to think about binds as having any neutrality at all, because somebody will have, even if it's a bare sliver, will have some sort of strength advantage in any bind, right? And that means that if you are not strong, you're weak, which means you don't even ever have to think about weakness at all. You can, you, you, the only thing you have to think about is whether or not in that moment you are strong. And if you are not 100% certain you're strong, you're weak, right? So we're already talking about, we have the five words, but of the first pair, only one's important, right? The second pair, for a knock, is a little trickier, right? Because in order for me to effectively threaten somebody, that person has to not be an idiot, right? If I stick my sword into Nate's face and he just stands there thinking that I'm not going to hit him, I can't actually fence Nate because Nate's not listening to me. So I have to instead just hit him with my sword, which is not fencing. It's not the same, right? He has to be able to respect my threat, and I have to be able to respect his threat. So the only thing you have to worry about in terms of for a knock is if you are threatened currently right now. That's the only thing that's important. Because if you don't act when you are threatened, you're not acting with advantage, right? Um, 
these advantages are these are physical realities, right? A lot of times when people talk about fencing theory, they, they immediately just assume it's like this is metaphysics, this is just kind of this theoretical thing. And they are not. They are observable physical realities that exist in every single crossing of the sword in any case, right? It's whether or not you're paying attention to them that makes a difference. So these are not metaphysics, this isn't woo, this isn't like spirituality, this is observable physical realities, right? Um, the fact that they're so vague is what makes them useful. Right? This isn't like a designed analytical system. This is just kind of how people intuitively behave under conditions of threat or conditions of stress or conditions of interpersonal combat. Um, they're not, as modern people, we tend to want things to be standardized. We want things to mean the same thing all the time. And the medieval kind of culture, medieval intellectual culture, was much, much, much more okay with vagueness, right? Because the vagueness is what makes it useful. If I, if the only thing I ever have to concern myself with is whether my position is strong, then any position that I'm in, I can make stronger, right? Um, if I have an army and I'm up on a hill, that's obviously stronger than if I'm down at the bottom of the hill, right? But that might change because what if it's wet? What if, what if my army overslept? What if it's really hot in the middle of the day? What if we don't have water, right? All of these little things will change the way that we behave on the battlefield because we have to act to our own advantage. And we cannot ignore disadvantages that we might need to bolster up or anything like that. And we'll be kind of bouncing back and forth between talking about war and talking about fencing. But for the most part, that's kind of what we need to understand, right? So strength and weakness is all about positioning, it's all about leverage, it's all about the, the, the fact that I am unmovable and you are very movable, right? Um, you can also respond against, you can defeat strength with weakness. We'll talk about what that looks like on battlefields and what it looks like in fencing a little later. And then, of course, we have for a knock, uh, before and after, ahead versus behind, or you can think in, kind of in terms of threat, right? If I am threatened, I'm in the knock. I must respond and deal with that threat before I can do anything else, because it's not safe otherwise. I'll get hit with a sword otherwise, and I don't want to do this, right? So the last word we have, obviously, we have the four, right? Only two of those four words are important, right? Uh, whether you are threatened is more important than whether you're threatening your opponent, and whether you're strong is more important than whether you're weak, right? Um, because you can use the fact that they are contrary positions to understand. If I am not currently threatening, I'm probably threatened and I should probably do something about that, right? So understanding that this is what they mean, physically, is food, right? It's, it's your sensitivity, it's your perception of your position in the fight, uh, and acting on it to your advantage is indexed. That's it. That's all Indez is. We don't have to spend 10,000 words describing it. Indez is just movement to advantage. That's it. It's you constantly retaining the advantages that you have and taking extras whenever you can. That's Indez, right? So if we understand that concept, we can take it and apply it to things that aren't fencing in a way that makes sense, in a way that kind of deepens our understanding of that. And then contrarily, deepening our understanding of warfare through the five words will deepen our understanding of the five words of fencing because now we have a deeper pool of meaning that we can draw from when we're trying to explain it to people, right? Um, one of the best definitions of Indes I have ever read uh, was written by Mark Twain when he was talking about riverboat piloting on the Mississippi River. And he just says it's, it's all about judgment. You have to know the shape of the river. You have to know exactly where you are. You have to know the difference between a shoal of fish versus the wind going across the river versus uh, water going over a sandbar. You have to know all of the differences to that and you have to have the judgment to make the correct decision. He's not describing Indes, but he is describing Indes, right? These are things that are intuitive to people. This is how we understand the world. And it's only by kind of filtering it through this, this sense that these ideas are connected and they're useful together that we can start using it to understand anything, right? Anything. So from riverboat piloting to fencing to anything that you might think of, right? To playing Hunt Showdown in 2024. <laughs> and being able to instantly analyze exactly why I lost. <laughs> and what mistake I made. Have, yes. Uh, give me a, a Fulin again. I'm sorry. Uh, Fulin is just German for feeling. Feeling, okay. Um, depending on the text tradition that you're coming from, um, Meyer has some slightly different, uh, he's more specific in some respects about like Fulin. So Meyer talks about Fulin being perception, right? Whereas a lot of the earlier German texts talk about Fulin can only be when the swords are touching, mm -hmm. right? 
I think it's more useful to think about it in terms of decoupling it from the physical sensation of touching swords, but earlier German texts differ a little bit, so I just want to make that clear, right? This isn't, what I'm describing is not the universal way that everybody should understand this. I just think this is the most useful way to understand it. Um, so there's obviously, there's people here who, if you go ask them what Indes is, six hours later you still won't know, and they <laughs> have been talking the entire time, right? Um, so. Does that answer your question? Yes, just, I, I, yeah. I, I wasn't, I'm not looking for deep dive, your thoughts. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now, who knows who that is? Carl Oswitz. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just making sure you all know how to read. Uh, so Carl Oswitz was a Prussian soldier. Uh, he lived in the 19th century, and he wrote a book called On War. Uh, somebody else wrote a book called On War. You know who, who wrote that book? Machiavelli. Yeah, it was Machiavelli, yeah. He's deliberately making a reference to Machiavelli. Uh, Klaus has talked about Machiavelli. He talks about Machiavelli's uh, sort of methodological errors. Um, in the nice thing about 19th century writing is that almost everything is polemical, <laughs> meaning almost everything is has a target, <laughs> right? Uh, Clausewitz is probably, uh, like many of us are, like many choleric people are, motivated mostly by spite. <laughs> it's when you pick up on war, it's a book this big, right? And it looks like this huge, massive tome. It's actually like very readable. It's ex it's very fun to read. It's really interesting. There's a lot of anecdotes in it, and there's a lot of sort of subtle polemical stuff uh, about Prussians and war and politics and everything. But even uh, somebody who's trying to s to make war into a science is using terms like strong and weak, and just expecting that his reader knows what that means, right? Because it's obvious what it means. One of the things I do at home is I teach homeschool kids, who some of them is eight, how to fence. And we use pool noodles. And I talk about strong and weak, and I give them pool noodles, and they'll instantly understand if they're weak because the pool noodle will bend if it's weak. And if you're in a strong position, it won't, because you're stronger, right? And as soon as kids figure that out, they start winding with the pool noodles. I have not told them what winding is. I haven't given them anything from the text other than strong and weak. And they start playing, and within half an hour, they are fencing. They're not just trying to whack each other with a pool noodle, although that's also happening. <laughs> uh, they can fence. They can learn how to fence just through this, because strong and weak is so intuitive to our physicality that you can just instantly, as long as you can you know, get hands on something, you can instantly teach anybody what it means and what it feels like. right? And what it feels like is much more important than intellectually what it means. Because what it feels like is going to motivate your actions. And motivating your actions to your advantage um, and so Prussian school historiography influenced a lot of early 20th century writers. So chances are, if uh, any of you have researched any kind of warfare in the early 16th century, you've probably heard of guys like Charles Oman or Hans Delbruck. Uh, if you've ever seen Young Frankenstein, you also have seen Hans Delbruck. Uh, arguably, maybe not the same guy, but same name. <laughs> uh, they're both military historians, and they're using Clausewitz's ideas to go through history and mine it for the most modern version of warfare through the centuries, right? So it's Charles Oman who describes the, the, the birth of the Landsbank as Maximilian making training reforms to his armies. Like, that's how he describes it, right? If you were part of my lecture last night, you know that's complete fucking nonsense because they didn't train Landsbank. The, the, the purpose of a Landsbank is you can hire them right now and you can send them tomorrow to where they need to go to beat people up for your own advantage, right? So, the Prussian school influenced military history in a way that basically suggested that the purpose of military history is to go back and look for all of the bits that changed war toward modern war, right? Because the idea, this is based on an idea called Whig history, or Whiggery, or Whiggish history. Have you heard this term before? So Whig history, Whiggishness is the idea that, that society from cavemen on to now has progressed in a linear fashion. That technology just purely advances, that we just make progress from, from zero to now. It's so been nothing but this linear advancement of technology and social hierarchy and all this stuff. And they believed that at the end of the 19th century because they had done they had done imperialism for the last hundred years or so, and all white people thought, this is great, this is the best, this is a utopian civilization. How did we get here? And Whig history is trying to answer that question. How did we arrive at the perfect market utopia? That, that exists at the end of the 19th century. And they do that by going back through history and using kind of Clausewitz's tools and Clausewitz's uh, method of framing warfare 
to find examples of where things changed toward the modern, obviously perfect systems that they had in the late 19th century. Right? So when you have when you read Charles Oman or Hans Zeltberg, sometimes they're the only people that write books. Like uh, Oman has a book called Warfare in the 16th Century. It's a really entertaining read because it's packed with anecdotes. It's, it's all it's got all sorts of examples of battles and campaigns and strategies and everything like that. But you have to understand that what Charles Oman is trying to do is convince you that Maximilian took one step forward on the line of linear progress because he trained the Lanzknecht just like the Swiss pikemen. Right? The Swiss pikemen also didn't train. What they did is they got drunk in a pub and they decided if there's an imperial army nearby, they would round up their boys in the pub and go attack their camp at night. Right? <laughs> they didn't have to train because they lived in the mountains. And if you come up in the mountains, well, it's on, right? Um, so Prussian military theory is still pretty prevalent in military history. Uh, a lot of military history, history is written by people who are not historians. They're written by journalists, it's written by soldiers, it's written by people with military training of any kind. It was written by people with an interest in military history. And generally in graduate school, we, uh, professional historians tend not to study war because like, there's nothing really historically meaningful about studying how people kill each other. Like the physical mechanics of it, right? This is why we don't know what like what it looks like when you're in the middle of, a, of like a pike block because it's impossible to study and nobody does. Um, so a lot of professional or a lot of modern trained historians who study warfare study things like supply and logistics and macroeconomics and population <coughs> demographics and dietary like they study all sorts of stuff that like to a room full of people who are interested in related weapons like Connor. <laughs> What, what's it like to be in the middle of a pipe block? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my history professors told me that military history dominated European academic history as a subject yeah. for like a hundred years, mm -hmm. and now that's that's kind of old and passe. Too. Yeah. Is that still true in your yeah. opinion? Yeah. Um, a lot of the best um, books written about war that I've encountered uh, generally have. They're not necessarily interested in the battles and everything. Um, they're interested in sort of like, I think one of the best history books I've ever read is uh, Jill Lepore's book called The Name of War. It's about King Philip's War in American history. And her whole argument about the book is essentially that the war itself happened, and then afterward, another war happened between the, the recording of it, right? And the way people chose to record it, the way people chose to talk about the war and the way people chose to sort of exemplify certain virtues that they saw in you know colonial civilization versus indigenous civilization that continued this conflict and that led to kind of a lot of ideas about American nationalism that became prevalent in the 1770s, right? So like that's the kind of thing that most what I think are good military histories are actually studying is that sort of thing rather than like the flanking maneuvers and battles and stuff. But this whole thing is about giving us an analytical tool to do exactly that. Because I know that this is a group of people who are probably interested in things like flanking maneuvers and night attacks and stuff like that. Yeah. It's look for L E P O R E. Uh, L E P O R E. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to understand a little bit about warfare in the 16th century uh, before we go on. So this is a, a bit of woodcut from Maximilian's Triumphal Arch. If anybody's ever seen that, it's a massive, huge woodcut. Um, there's, there's something like 70 individual uh, woodcuts in it, and it's, just, it's basically, from the start, it's a, like a civic parade that as it goes back toward the end, you start seeing things more like this. So this is a supply wagon with some camp followers, um, and a dude playing the horn up there, and <laughs> usefully employing himself on top of the baggage, uh, right? right? Um, so, warfare until the modern era, basically until the First World War, is mostly all about constraints. There's, you just don't have the ability to do things that we do today. There's no helicopters, no aerial photography, there's no guarantee that you even know where you're going, right? Um, it wasn't even common to use maps in the 16th century for things like military campaigns, because why do you need a map if you just hire somebody who lives around the place who can show you around, right? It's much more useful to hire a guy who knows where everything is than it is to try to map it, because mapping and cartography is a specific skill that you need a lot of training for, and you also need to pay people like that a lot more money than you can probably afford because you're you're so badly in debt not paying your lunch next year, right? <laughs> um, 
so it has a lot of constraints. You have to you have to go with your baggage. Your baggage has to be hauled in big old wagons. It has to be drawn by horses or oxen. Um, it's very slow. It's very ponderous. It takes a long time to kind of get all your pikes and armor and everything out of the wagons and put it on and then deploy for battle. It takes a long, long time. So we have this notion that is really important up until again the 20th century called giving battle. The idea of giving battle is. If I have an army, and Nate has an army, and Nate's army is chasing me, and I don't want to fight Nate because I have no advantage in fighting Nate, I can always retreat faster than he can deploy. I can always do it. So if I see him coming, and then I see his little wings of soldiers coming out and marching toward me, I can just move away. And he's wasted a whole bunch of time. Uh, so I have to, uh, if I want to fight Nate, find a place where I think I have an advantage, and then I choose to fight him. Right? And it's possible that, I, that he could catch me and ambush me or outmaneuver me or whatever. Um, but more or less, more often than not, if you're having a battle, like a big open field battle, it's because both sides believe that they can win. Because both sides believe that they have more of an advantage than the other guy does, right? And we can apply this back to fencing because you might run into people out there in the wild who will scoff when you're working on like a strip of mire and they'll say, I wouldn't do that, I'll just step back. <laughs> right? And they mean that seriously. And they mean and what they mean is like it's not worth it to study the Stuck because you can always break them. Because they, they think that the, the purpose of learning a Stuck is so that you can robotically go through it when you're fencing and then you'll win somehow. And the, the actual purpose of them is to teach you sort of a physical and mental fluidity to respond to, to pressures and feeling and advantage and whatnot. And it gives you specific stock examples of two fencers giving battle and like you know, we don't have a bunch of Stuck and Meyer that's just a guy going like this, right? Because it's more valid for us to learn how to fence when somebody is in there and decides, I have advantages, I'm staying here and I'm going to fence here, right? Um, and if we apply that idea to our fencing, we can understand a lot of things. We'll get into some stuff later. But, um, so I think that's an important idea uh, to take back to fencing, right? The idea that you're only ever going to fence somebody when you want to. And if you, if you feel like you have no advantage in the situation that you're in, you can always do the universal defense, which is just this, right? And more often than not, you can, you can retreat probably a bit faster than somebody who is assaulting you, but then they'll catch up to you and force you to fight again, especially if you're fighting in a small ring, and you can only like step one place away before you get a, a not for big out there. Um, we also have, in the 16th century on, so about the 18th century, really confusing command hierarchy. Because the thing is, right? If I if I decide I'm gonna I'm gonna go and get coronated finally, Maximilian tried over and over and over again, and he gets an army together. What he does is he rounds up his best boys, who he knows like can hire mercenaries. He finds the guys who have both chickens on the belt, and he asks them like, I need you to get your best goons for me so that we can go down to Rome and I can get coronated. And the thing is that that gives you an enormous amount of power. Because if I'm relying on you entirely for my manpower, and I have my small retinue that is loyal to me, but you have 5,000 guys who are loyal to you, I have to defer to you in certain situations, right? I can't just tell you, suicidally go charge that line of cannons, because you won't do it. Because why would you, right? So I have to, uh, when I'm corresponding with you, I have to correspond with a lot of respect. I have to make sure that you know that I respect you and your position. I have to make sure that I'm caging my orders in ways that will make you do them rather than make you mutiny, right? And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of this kind of give and take and push and pull. There's a lot of politics in this mode of warfare because you have to make sure that everybody's going in the same direction and that you don't have the power. You literally do not have the political uh, or social or violent power to just like hang people that don't listen to you. It isn't possible in this period of history. Uh, it's, it's too multi-phasing. There's too many different kind of silos of power that are all trying to, to uh, coordinate together. And unless you're really good at making sure that those guys are acting to their advantage and acting to their advantage is acting to your advantage, that's the difficulty of warfare. That's why Maximilian can't ever seem to get to Rome with an army, is because he's running into problems paying them. He's running into problems with politics among uh, his officers. He's running into problems where he literally, as the emperor, doesn't have enough coercive power to make sure people do what he says. Because they still need to be paid, and they still need to be honored, and they still need to be respected. Um, it's really hard to run a, a military campaign in the 16th century. It's the most expensive thing, outside of maybe building a cathedral, that a, a civilization could do at this time. Yes? Now, do these, these constraints and this kind of uh, difficulty with command hierarchies go back? Does that apply, you know, 
factors as well? Yes. Is it all pre-modern warfare? Uh, not all. When you get to like Rome, it's a little bit different. Um, so the, like the classical era has the, the mechanisms of state are so different than the medieval period that they do have this kind of force of power and they can just kind of raise armies and tell people what to do. But then you also get guys who are like Caesar, who become so powerful because they're such popular leaders that they can challenge the power of, of the republic itself. Right? Um, so it's a little bit different, but uh, in in all that we would call the medieval period, and probably even a couple hundred years before the fall of Rome, this is pretty standard. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, a term I think is really useful called campaign communities. So a campaign community is uh, like a, a company of mercenaries will always have a certain number of what they call camp followers. So here in this woodcut, uh, these women back there are called camp followers. And camp followers are um, service workers that travel with the army. Uh, they work as sex workers often, they work as laundresses, as nurses, as seamstresses, as tailors, and they do all sorts of really important work to keep the army going, um, with mostly unpaid. Uh, if they're paid at all, they're paid by people who hire them to like live in their tent with them and, and like do their cooking and do their cleaning and do their laundry. And it, you know, it's terrible. But this was the way that, that uh, women actually had a lot of value on campaign because they're doing things that men either refuse to do because it's just not what men do, or they're too dumb to do it. <laughs> There's a lot of problems when like uh, armies have to leave their supplies, not necessarily that they can't feed themselves, but because like they can't do their laundry, um, and they're not they're not actually like boiling the camp water when they need to, because they just don't know the difference between good water and bad water because that's something that women know, right? Um, so it's. There's, there's problems like this that, that persist all the time, and it's not until about the 18th century where they're starting to reform supply conditions and everything that we start seeing camp followers kind of wither away from armies. But they, they remain through the 19th century. Um, and they're really critical parts of how armies operate, right? Because a campaign community is this sort of village on the move. Uh, and eventually they might have some fighting to do, but for the most part your job is to keep them together because even having an army in this period is so highly threatening and it forces your political opponents to like do things. Yes? You had said that a lot of these individuals were mostly unpaid, these, yeah. these uh, <coughs> campaign followers. So are these people staying because they are prisoners of war and cannot leave, or are there all other reasons why they are staying with this community? Yes. Yeah. Right, there's, there's tons of like, uh, many camp followers may have been there against their will. They may have been literally kidnapped from their villages. Um, some of them could have been prisoners of war that were like captured when another army was destroyed. They could have been camp followers of another army. Uh, they could also have just been like when a. I think one of the better ways to understand sort of mercenary warfare is to think about a mercenary company more like a like a film production company, right? You're making a movie, and once you're done, or you're wrapped with filming with the movie, you have a bunch of technicians and you know best boys and people who hold the lights and everything, who now need to go find the next movie to work on. And that's kind of the culture of mercenary work, right? Is there's almost always a contract to be had. There's almost always somebody hiring for some campaign or another. And so you have these guys who sort of individually or in small groups kind of float from contract to contract. Because there's always a contract going on. So experienced camp followers with skills might, might actually get themselves hired. They might actually get themselves a position within the army that's really important. But there's also a lot of women who have been violently coerced into doing it as well. Uh, so it's. It's pretty brutal and it's, it's pretty awful, but that was that was the way these things worked. This is one of the reasons why when we get to the United States, they write the Second Amendment, which is warning against things like this, because this is considered such a rapacious and awful system that they don't want it anywhere near the United States, right? Do you, yes? Are you mostly on an individual basis, or do you have companies of watersets and companies of... Mostly individual. Uh, I don't know of any sort of collective group of uh, laundresses or camp followers or anything like that. Okay. That doesn't mean it didn't exist. Okay. Uh, it just, there was some sort of sense of um, a collective ethos among mercenaries, uh, among one snacks or Swiss Rise Law or whatever. Um, so there, there could have been the same sort of thing. And I know that, that uh, many people who had camp followers like in their tents, they refer to them as their wives. Um, so it probably would have been if you're a camp follower, you're attached to a specific man, or you're attached to a specific position or a specific officer. But uh, I don't know of any, any sort of like collective groups of, of uh, camp followers, as far as I know. Okay, I don't have a picture on this one, so 
So look at the little bit <laughs> So war is uh, war is really complicated because war it's not like everybody goes to the same field where you have a battle and then fight the battle over and over with the same number of guys with the same weapons and the same uniforms and everything, right? Everything's always different every time. Um, and we're going to bring in some other fencing terms to sort of make sense of some of this. So Zufechten, if you are, are in the German tradition, Zufechten means approach, right? It means the, the onset of fencing. Um, in warfare, the approach phase is sort of, you've got two armies, right? I need to find out where Nate's army is. So if I know vaguely they're kind of over there, I'm not just going to take my army and walk that way, because you'll see me coming and do something about it. Namely, he'll put his guys in the woods and shoot me as I come up. Um, so the two factors, I have to use scouts. I have to send people out. I have to make sure I know where you are. And once I find out where you are, I have to make sure that when I'm approaching you, I'm doing it in a way that will nullify the weaknesses or the disadvantages that I have, right? So if I find you on a hill with cannons, my approach has to take that into consideration. We're not just going to like slowly walk at you while you have cannons and shoot at me. I want to try to figure out a way to deal with that, right? And the Sufectin allows a commander to understand, to get a sense of where the advantages lie and what they should be doing to take the most advantage from that sort of thing, right? Um, this is really important to think about in terms of fencing, right? Because a lot of the time, uh, and this is not necessarily individual fencers' fault, but at many tournaments I've been to, the rings are very tiny. They're so cramped that you have no room to do anything. And you start with your swords essentially crossing, which means that you, are, you don't have a effective at all. There's no approach phase. You have no time to assess your opponent. You have no time to plan your assault. You have no time to do anything other than just sort of like try to defend against the flails that are coming in and withdraw the two steps that you have until you're out of the ring. Right? Um, that is a really truncated version of what fencing is. Like that as an individual game might teach like quick hands, but that's all it's ever teaching. You're never going to learn how to fence with advantage if you're fencing small rings all the time. Uh, you need more room. You need to be able to assess your opponent before you, you cross swords with them so that you and you have the time to do that if you have like five feet. That's it. That's all you need. It's not huge, but the the approach phase is really important in an era of warfare where there are no weapons that can fire beyond visual range. Right? So even if my cannon can fire a mile, which is about the longest I'm able to do anything against, that's 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 my zone of control, right? That's, if, I, if I have a disac, my zone of control is about the halfway point of my disac. And that's essentially like the range of my cannons, right? So I can see the guys coming for way longer than I can do anything about it, right? And that lets them make their dispositions against me, and that lets me make my dispositions against them, and I can see everything that they're doing. So if I'm watching them coming, and I think, oh, they're coming straight on into my cannons, perfect, just like I planned. And then I start seeing that they're going off to the side, well, I have to do something about it. And I could either, I could choose not to. I could just pretend that it doesn't exist and just shoot at my cannons, like I'm just kind of flailing at my sword at my opponent because I don't have any sense of advantage. Uh, or I can do something about it, right? And figuring out what to do and how to do it is foolish, right? This is a, another way that we can understand foolish. I was talking to uh, a friend of mine yesterday, and he was describing at an event he went to, they were, they were doing, they were sending scouts out. And he said they were pulsing, they were sending these pulses of scouts, and he was doing this with his hands. <laughs> and as I was doing it, I was like, yeah, it's like touching, right? It's like fooling, right? Um, and in, in sort of modern military uh, terms, they call that like in contact. You're engaged uh, with the enemy, right? You have, you, you have people looking at them who can tell you where they are. But again, in the 16th century, you don't have radios. You don't have carrier pigeons even. You have to physically send a person with either a note or their voice to tell the commander what's going on and what's happening. And I have to trust that the person who's telling me that knows what they're doing <coughs> and is actually giving me accurate information, right? Because it is possible that the person telling me this is lying. It's possible that they made a mistake. It's possible that the report they got from a person came from somebody who was super panicky and they said they have 10,000 men. And it's, it's just like the tail end of like one small group of laundresses that they decide is, you know. So you just never know, right? And it, this is what uh, Clausewitz calls the fog of war. Right? This is the sense that you don't actually have all of the information. And this is a really big difference between fencing and warfare, because generally, you have all the information that you need in fencing, because it's just one other person, and you can look at them, and you can see how they're armed, and you can see how they move, and you can see their behavior, as long as you have some time to defend them, right? So, when we think about trying to translate this stuff into five words terms, who has an idea of what a tactical strength might look like? 
what, what be, what's an example of something that's tactically strong? Like high ground. High ground, definitely. Yep. Well, for the fencing. Ford. Oh, sorry. For fencing, so the, this person has longer arms or longer. Yep. Like, longer reach. reach. Yep. Or, yep. Whatever. Uh, control over resources like water source or something. Yeah, like definitely. Um, you're talking about cutting off the canals uh, going into Pisa or, or uh, Bolognese. Bologna. That's the name of the city. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yes. They have more horses than we do. Yeah, they have more cavalry. They have more men, period. Right? They have, uh, uh, they, they went to all the pubs and hired all the guides before you got there. Right? Yeah. Experienced commander versus inexperienced. Experienced versus inexperienced, definitely. Sometimes that can turn out to be a disadvantage because of novelty. We'll talk about that in a second, right? So there's also examples of tactical weakness, right? So what if, try to think about it in terms of, again, we've got a pair of contraries, right? So if there's an army that has a high ground, how might we deal with an army with a high ground? What's a way that we can circumvent or weaken, use a weak action to nullify that advantage? Yeah. Isolate them. You can isolate them, sure. Yeah, cut them off from their, their support, cut them off from their supplies. Yeah. You can, you can draw them off their high ground. Like you can you provoke them yeah. to coming off their position advantage. Yeah. You can scare them. You can scare them for sure, yeah. You can also use threats, right? So like, uh, rather than just charging straight up the hill, I can bring my cannons up, right? And if my cannons are out of range of their musketeers, they can't just sit there getting shot with cannons, they're gonna do something, right? And they might just retreat on the, onto the other side of the hill so I can't shoot them with my cannons, but that nullifies that, that position of strength, right? It's a way that we can deal with it by using weaker tactics, right? Weaker just means avoidant, right? Indirect, things that, that aren't just charging straight in, right? Whereas strong tactical actions are ones that, that do just go straight in, right? Um, what's some other examples of, of actions that are tactically weak? Yeah. Strike your forces then to make them look bigger, just to make yeah. larger numbers. Yeah. So uh, in Detroit in 1812, it, the, the War of 1812, Detroit was captured in August of 1812. And part of why it was captured was because William Hull was convinced that he called the Northern Hive of Indians was let loose on the territory. And uh, Tecumseh, who was in charge of these native auxiliaries that were fighting with the British, uh, had this particular stratagem after they crossed the Detroit River where there was a bald hill in between two sets of woods that was visible from the fort walls. And he had his men just walk along the ridge line and then they duck back behind and run back around. And they just did this all day. Like, <laughs> so it looked like to Hull that there were thousands more Native Americans than there actually were. Right? Um, and this is a position where if you look at the actual disposition of forces, William Hull was much stronger. But he was convinced that he was in a, in a super weak position. and more importantly, he knew that he wasn't getting more supplies. So he ended up surrendering Fort Detroit without a fight. Uh, he was tried and convicted of treason for doing that. <laughs> wow. And then that sentence was commuted. Uh, and this was, talk me afterward. <laughs> <laughs> um, but another example, a common example of tactical weakness is just a planking maneuver, right? If I'm pointed this way and you're attacking from this way, right? Yeah, exactly. Or boomslogging, cutting around, right? So we can connect these, these uh, sort of tactical movements on the battlefield to actions in the handwork uh, very easily, right? Um, and it provides a, a sort of a richer way to explain things like doing an umschlag, cutting around, right? Why do you cut around? Because I am so weak in this position that there's no, there's no reason for me to try to force my way back to a position of strength. I just cut around somewhere else, right? And that's how, in, you know, when you read the table, when you read the kind of the older German text, they talk about weakness is the response to strength, right? It's because doing a weak action against a strong opponent is going to make them, it's going to force them to move. And if you force them to move, you take away their advantage, right? Um, one of the big differences, again, between warfare and fencing is that it's harder to have parity in war, right? Parity meaning uh, when you read any book written about fencing, there are certain assumptions that are made that they maybe address elsewise in like one one little section, right? So you, you read Fabris, and Fabris has a whole thing about like how to fence people who are taller or shorter or angrier or cooler or whatever. But the rest of the book is presented as if you are fencing somebody with the exact same weapon who is exactly the same size as you, right? And the reason they do this is because it would be a billion times more complicated to write a book that is attempting to tell you, like, start reading this book if you're short. 
on page 16. Start, if you're tall, start reading the book on page 32, right? There's just too many variables to explain. So they're explaining, they're explaining fencing through this impossibly, uh, impossibly like perfect parody, right? And you have to, to intellectually discuss fencing because it's too complicated to, to not uh, assume parity in that, right? Whereas in warfare, the closest we get to parity is, is called peer conflict. And this is another term from Clausewitz. So peer conflict means rather than the British fighting the Boers, it's the British fighting the French, right? Um, as an industrial nation, they both have the same capabilities. They both have the same capabilities of mass production, mass conscription, arming uh, and uniforming men, medical things, right? So that uh, peer conflicts generally have a much different character than asymmetric warfare, right? And again, if you're thinking about American frontier warfare versus uh, warfare of the First World War, it's very different. And it has to be very different because the Germans in 1918 are much more capable of threatening the American forces in novel ways than the Comanche ever were, right? Um, fighting against indigenous, uh, indigenous warfare or frontier warfare is almost always characterized by the industrial nation being one of constantly fighting from positions of strength and creating positions of strength, and the response from that is weakness, right? Um, in the 1790s, during uh, what was called the, uh, the Northwest War or the Wabash Confederacy War, uh, Anthony Wayne, who had formed the Legion of the United States, basically just built forts into Indian territory one at a time. From like you have like a day trip or whatever, and then you build another fort. And he spent two years doing this, and they had one battle at the end, and this convinced the Wabash Confederacy tribes to surrender because they just can't do the forts. But what they can do, and this is an actual this is an actual thing that happened at one point. Uh, this is before the formation of the Legion of the United States. This is in the early 1790s. Uh, you can have some indigenous men looking to get into some trouble, hiding in the woods, clucking like turkeys, to convince the officer of the fort to go outside with a shotgun to go hunting for turkeys, and then you can tomahawk it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is the kind of thing that uh, indigenous warfare is all about deception and trickery and luring people into positions of weakness and <coughs> absolutely crushing them. And they're very, very, very good at this, but that's the only thing they're good at in terms of this kind of this high-level strategic concept of warfare, right? And I'm not saying that it's inevitable that industrial nations defeat indigenous nations, because that's not true, but generally this is the character of these kind of frontier wars, is that the industrial nation, the nation with more resources, is always going to be looking to find positions of strength and fight from those, and the, the frontier nations, the indigenous nations, are always trying to lure those into positions of weakness. Yeah. Would you say this is also just between societies I don't want to say the different level, but the different stages. Like everything you said also applies Romans fighting in yes. the wars. They're yep. not industrial, but they're building the camp, they're building the supplies, they're creating the supply system. And when you create a level of camps, very soon their tribes have nowhere to go. Right. Yes. And they can only surround yeah. them. Um, sort of uh, diplomacy is also a tool, in, in, at least in North American warfare. most. Most Indian wars were actually ended because uh, Americans were able to convince neighboring indigenous tribes not to be involved in the war at all. Which means not only not fighting against the United States, but also not offering parts and food and places to crash for the people that are fighting against the colonial nation, right? Um, the way that I would probably characterize it, which is sort of free of that kind of whiggish idea of linear advancement, would be that most European nations have, I talked about it a bit in my lecture last night, what they're looking for is cultivating this idea of discipline. Right? They have this, this ingrained sense of you are disciplined, you are going to obey orders, we're going to make sure that you do things, and the threat, if you don't, is that we'll hang you, or shoot you, or cut your head off, or do whatever. Right? You obey us or die. And that's what they're essentially doing to the indigenous people. They're trying to bring them into this system of discipline. But most indigenous cultures don't have these coercive tools in their society at all. People are generally much freer, and much freer to, to make up their minds on their own. And so if you try to, to get like the British did, let's get a bunch of Indians to attack this fort, they're going to say, no, the walls are too high. They have too many guns in there. We're just going to die for no purpose, so we're not going to do that. But if the same British guys take, give orders to Major whoever who really, wants, who really wants to get in the good graces of Queen Victoria, he's going to go leave his hundred men straight into the teeth of cannon fire and probably die. <laughs> and that's just because that's how, the, that's how the cultures are created, right? And that's, there's different cultural value systems that are at play. And there's different senses of individual 
work, right? Um, so that's kind of how I would explain the sort of asymmetry is, is more of just cultural aspects rather than something that's inherently technological or inherently kind of advanced versus whatever. Okay, so this is where we're going to kind of get into the weeds a little bit, right? So well, let me go back actually. Let me talk about novel threads. Um, so novelty is why we need analytical systems, right? Uh, the thing is, there's a, sort of a debate in HEMA right now about kind of training techniques and how, how to create better sensors, and there's a, a concept called the ecological approach. And the ecological approach basically says, don't drill over and over and over, play games, right? Make, make, give reasons for fencers to make correct choices that are valued in the game that you're playing, rather than telling them this is the way you do it so we're not or this is the way you need to stand all the time, or whatever, right? Um, the traditional way of doing that, obviously, is it works for certain things, like if you need to drill certain techniques and just get literal big gross movement going, you obviously need to do some, some fair drilling there. But um, playing sort of games constantly introduces this idea of novelty. And the idea of this sort of ecological approach, like right? ecology just means the context. That's literally what it means, conceptual games, right? Or contextual games. Um, and uh, some of the theory about the ecological approach is based on studies that were done by a Soviet scientist in the 1920s. And the Soviets in the 1920s were like, well, now we're building a communist utopia, so we need workers to do it. So we need to get as many workers worked up as, as fast as we possibly can, and we're going to use science to do it. So what they did was they, they uh, took a bunch of blacksmiths, and they had them all working on some project. And they had like master blacksmiths on one end and novice blacksmiths on the other. And they took a camera and they had a guy working, trying to like cutting tin with his hammer, and they took stroboscopic pictures of the movement, right? So this way they could look at the way that the, the arm moves. And the expectation was the masters are always going to do the same motion with their arm. And if we can find out what that motion is and train it to the novice blacksmiths, they'll get better way faster than if they're just training in the kind of traditional way. And what happened was, when you look at the pictures, the blacksmith's arms all the fuck over anyway. It doesn't actually follow a specific pattern. Well, the difference is that the master blacksmiths are always doing the thing very precisely. They're always <coughs> accomplishing their objective, no matter what position their arm is in. And this is just a physiological limitation that humans have, right? So we can drill 100 Zornhaut orbs, and every single time I swing my sword, it's going to be slightly variable than the time before. And that's novelty. Right? In fencing, that's the thing that we have to deal with. And this is why vagueness is useful. is because if I only have to study what it feels like to be strong, I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to think about the different degrees the sword's coming in. I just have to know as soon as I can, I'm in a weak position, so I must do a weak action to get stronger. Right? Um, so novel threats are something that in fencing is generally constrained in just kind of the, the differences in build, the differences in attitude, the differences in the sword trainer you're using. All these other things, but it is constantly novel, um, and you'll constantly come across people doing things that are surprising, that that don't make sense, right? Because there are a lot of there are a lot more fencers out there who don't really know how to fence than there are people who are like really artful and careful, right? So if you're expecting somebody to do the thing that makes sense and they don't, that's novelty, and fencing is a way to train you to deal with those emergent exigencies without necessarily having to drill every single possible example of somebody using a novel threat against you, right? You just have to know what it feels like when you're weak so that you can act properly. And if you act properly knowing the constraints you're under, that's in depth. That's it, right? Uh, novel threats in warfare we're going to talk about as part of the First World War. Because the First World War is very, very likely, um, maybe not everybody here, because I know, again, there's probably a lot more military history and some people here than otherwise, but a lot of the way we understand the First World War, a lot of the way it's, it's discussed in terms of culture, is anybody ever seen Blackadder? <laughs> right? So Blackadder is great, but its First World War history is terrible. Um, it, it is not a war that's characterized just by like mass human slaughter with no purpose. Um, you, you may have heard the term lions led by donkeys, right? The idea was that Especially the British boys are so stalwart and brave and honorable, but they're led by idiots who don't care about them, who are just willing to sacrifice them to you know, German machine guns. And that's kind of the concept, right? 
And to an extent, it makes sense to think about it this way because a lot of military history books are written that way, and a lot of the ways presented in pop culture is also presented, right? The end of Blackadder is that they go up and charge, and the, the implication we're supposed to take away is they all get machine gunned to death, and that's it, right? And it transitions to the poppy fields, and we think, oh, what a mad sacrifice. Uh, and in reality, this is one of the clearest, as a war, it's one of the clearest examples of a peer conflict in which every single participant is always acting to their own advantage that I think exists in modern war. And the reason for this is because technology itself was only really kind of getting to a point where we can invent things like airplanes and interrupted gear and invent entirely new arts that we can use to make sense of the battlefield, right? So aerial photography was used for the first time in the First World War. And that also meant that uh, photographic interpretation was invented as a part of the First World War. Because if you have a bunch of guys taking pictures and then they land, like, here's some pictures, and they dump a bunch of glass plates at your feet, you don't know where they came from, you don't know what this is a picture of, you don't know what these lines on the ground look like, so you have to, you have to from the ground up, invent ways to make sense of these pictures, figure out what they're pictures of, put them together into huge massive photo collages, and then make maps based on that. Right? And this is all just happening, because you have to. This is the way that you can best use a new tool that you have, the, you know, the airplane. And you know this is a novel threat. If your opponent has aerial photography and they know where all of your artillery guns are, the next time they attack you, they're just going to blow up your artillery, and then they're going to walk into your trenches. That's it. So how do you deal with that? Well, yeah. I mean, if I know they're taking pictures and they blew up my artillery guns, I think maybe Next time, I'm going to hide my artillery guns with something that looks sure. like shrubbery or bush, yeah. bush or something. Let's yeah. Move them. Or move them. Shoot down yeah. their planes. Or you can move them. You can shoot down their planes. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot down their planes with planes with machine guns on them now. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, the air war is really interesting. It's a really interesting sort of microcosm about these these competing novelties, right? Because uh, the the problem with putting machine guns on an airplane is that you have a propeller in front. And if you shoot the machine gun into your propeller, you shoot your propeller off, and now you don't have an airplane. Uh, and this happened pretty often. It, it didn't. It, it wasn't like somebody like put a machine gun on their plane and then flew up to 10,000 feet and then blew their propeller off. They started their airplane and they probably had guys literally holding the tail while it was going because many of these didn't actually have throttles. It was just on or off. They had what they called a flip switch that you can just interrupt it for like a second so you slow down like a little bit. Anyway. You're on the ground with the propeller going, and you try shooting the machine gun through it, and you obliterate your propeller. Nobody dies. Many, 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 many people die in training accidents in the First World War, especially in the air war, but nobody flew up into the air and then shot themselves down. <laughs> right? That's not quite how it happened. Um, but one of the first ways that they tried to get around the fact that you can shoot your own propeller off is just to put metal on the propeller. So the bullet just bounce off of it rather than shoot it. <laughs> and uh, the French were the first to try this, and the, the French, uh, a, a French pilot shot down two German planes and then crashed himself, and the Germans found it. And the traditional story is really amusing. Because that, and, then, and then they say that Anthony Fokker took this and reverse engineered it and invented the interrupter gear, right? Which is just a little gear switch that prevents the gun from firing and the propellers in the way. It is, it is, it is in the way. Um, what really happened was they found this plane crash and the Germans were like, oh, they put metal on the propellers. That's dumb. And then he went and invented the interrupter gear. It had nothing to do with the French plane that they found. He just said, like, it's probably actually a really great advantage. It's a novel threat that we can have if we put machine guns that can shoot through the propellers. And they did that, and it led to, in 1915, they called it the Fokker skirt. Because what happened was, you have airplanes that suddenly can just point themselves at the scout planes and they shoot them down in droves. And they did this for a month in uh, it wasn't bloody April, that's a different thing. But uh, this was the, they called it the Fokker skirt. It was basically a month or so of essentially uninterrupted aerial dominance from the Germans because they were the first ones to figure out how to mount a propeller or a machine gun that fires through the propeller without shooting your own plane down. Um, so again, we can parse this, this technological arms race, through this sense of the five words, right? Once you've achieved this kind of position of unambiguous threat that you just have airplanes up there, What's the way that, that the British can respond to this? Obviously, they're going to go back and they're going to try to figure out how they're going to get, they're going to reverse engineer the interrupter here. And they actually did that because they did shoot Anthony Fokker down and they did find his thing and they were like, oh, it's just levers. And 
they put levers on their own planes <laughs> and they got back up there. But while that was happening, right, that takes a long time. It takes time to develop. So how do you respond to that? If you send anything up in the air, it's going to get shot down. What do you do? You still need spotters for your artillery. Fly at night. You can fly at night. You can try that. It's hard to spot for artillery if you're flying at night. Yeah, but put another guy in your plane with a machine gun. Yeah. Backwards. Yeah, you can do that. Don't shoot um, off your tail. Sorry, sorry. Just said, don't shoot off your tail. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that was also a problem. That, that was a that was a common thing that happened. Actually, shooting your own tail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know early British aces were flying planes that had propeller behind them, so the gun. Yeah. So there's pusher versus tractor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the way they mostly responded to this was by limiting flights as much as they possibly could. They still had to get scouts up to spot for artillery, and even spotting for artillery involves a lot of like coming up with like novel solutions to problems that are introduced by the fact that you you need to have a guy looking at where the shell is going, and you need to have that guy communicate back to the battery so that he can adjust it. And they come up with all sorts of like, clever ways in order to communicate this from an airplane, right? They don't have a radio. So they can't just like call down to the battery and say, you need to go left 300 feet. You know, you need to use, they call it a clock code, eventually. Some planes actually had a, uh, a tele, uh, an antenna that was like 20 meters long that you had to hand the crank out. And then you could send your little Morse code back to the, to the gun. But the gun couldn't communicate with you if you were only sending it one way. Eventually they figured out a two-way communication, but it took a long time. So this map here is what's called the race to the sea. What is the race to the sea? Is. This is kind of one of the first kind of big chunks of the First World War, right? So we have some open air, open field battles in kind of the Napoleonic sense, like rapid moving infantry, cavalry clashing with swords. Um, but rifles and machine guns have a really good way of killing a lot of people very quickly. And for the most part, uh, we start seeing just in response to artillery, right? Artillery is a huge, crazy threat. So what, what do you do against that? You make your position as strong as possible. And mostly you do that with earthworks. Right? Because earthworks are nice because dirt's free. Dirt's just there where you're standing. And if you dig into it, uh, you make your position a lot stronger. So uh, in early 1914, early on in the war, um, we start seeing soldiers entrench themselves, uh, more or less just kind of at night. They reach a position, and they don't want to get attacked at night. They don't want to be shelled, so they, they dig trenches, they dig foxholes, they dig kind of shallow embankments, right? So the next morning, the Germans wake up, and they see the French have have entrenched themselves, so they're like, well, it would be silly for me to just attack straight at that, that position of strength, right? They, they've got their long point pointed at me, and I'm not just gonna walk right onto it, I need to do something about it. So I'm gonna go around, I'm gonna move north, and I'm gonna attack them from the plank. But then at night, the British are like, you know, if we just sit here, they're just gonna go around us, so we should go around them. And so we have these sort of parallel movements of competing flanking actions that, that constantly get stopped because the armies at this point are basically a bunch of armed laborers led by engineers. So they're really good at doing earthworks. You can build a, a, a very uh, protective trench system in a single night because you can just tell people to do it, otherwise you're going to get blown up by artillery. And that's a pretty powerful motivator. <laughs> um, but the race to the seas is just really interesting. Like, it seems so silly to us when we're looking at it now because why can't you just go around? But if you're starting, you know, here, and you need to go there, and you have guys here, they need to move, and that takes time. And the Germans can see you doing that, because they have planes up there, and they also have just guys with eyes who can look at it. Uh, Baron Rodrikoff, before he became a pilot, was actually a cavalry scout. He was a, a, a lancer. And a lot of what he did on the Eastern Front was some scouting, and getting into skirmishes with other scouts, and more or less trying to blind the enemy scouts while also getting as much information as possible. Right? You, want, you want an advantage in pooling. And you can completely deny your opponent from feeling your sword, then you deprive them of valuable information. Is anybody familiar with Fabris? Right? So Fabris advocates keeping your sword free because you don't want to give your opponent strength information about your bind until the moment you hit them. Right? Um, so again, we can kind of take these ideas that we're getting from studying military history and we can make better sense of our fencing texts by kind of applying it retroactively. Um, okay, so we talked about the air war. What about submarine warfare? So submarines, uh, people can be pedantic if you want about whether or not they're actually submersible or whatever. But submarine warfare is a way to, uh, well, how would we characterize submarine warfare? 
when you characterize this as a strength or, or, or weak? Weak. Yeah. I think it's weak, right? But it is, it's again a novel threat. It's a threat that they, they just have there for free, right? The British don't have submarines. They don't have submarines in the first world war. They don't either. They do have a gigantic navy, though. And the reason that the Germans invest heavily in submarines is because they know that they cannot build enough ships to challenge the Royal Navy uh, in a stand-up fight. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. right. So they're using a weak strategy in order to topple a stronger opponent. And they're doing that by putting your boats underwater and putting torpedoes in. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't it true that there was one big naval battle where World War One? They yeah. came out, countered each other, and then went back, and then yeah. came back out again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Battle of Jutland, I think. Yeah. 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 Good point. Did you end up? I did. Uh, maybe I'm just missing it. Uh, I was being under the water a weak position because you can only because it's indirect. It's oh, avoidance. Sure. Right. Okay. So it. you're protecting yourself by denying your opponent the opportunity to hit you. Right? And you can do that by movement, you can do that by disguise and camouflage, you can also do that just by putting your boat underwater so that they can't eat it. Right? Uh, but from there, it's very threatening. So the, at first, submarine warfare was, was quite gentlemanly. So what would happen was, the submarines don't actually want to, sh want to sink battleships, that's a waste of time. Right? Uh, battleships can move, they're probably very aware of what's going on because you have soldiers, or sailors, whose job it is to like look at the water and tell you if there's a torpedo coming. It's hard, it's hard to sink battleships, even from even from uh, ambush. So instead what they're trying to do is attack the supply lines. They're attacking merchant ships that are coming in and bringing in supplies. The problem is merchant ships also, this is also a capitalist economy, and in order to make money, people who are running ships also have passengers on board. So the thing was, the Germans actually didn't want to murder uh, a bunch of civilians if they could avoid it, because this would make them look bad in the eyes of the world, even though they're very busily in Belgium committing war crimes pretty much every single day. But that's not limited only to the Germans. Anyway, so at first what they do is uh, a U-boat finds a merchant ship. Uh, they they uh, come up from under the water, they point their deck gun at it, and they say, get everybody off, we're going to sink the ship. And everybody politely gets into lifeboats, and then they sink the ship, and then the Germans radio the British, and they say, come and pick these guys up, we just sink the ship. And they did this for like two or three years. Uh, and one of the responses from the, uh, the Allies was they made what they called Q-ships. And a Q ship was a disguised merchant vessel. So what you did was, you have a merchant vessel, it's just like the Lusitania or whatever, it's a passenger liner, and rather than lifeboats on the sides of the thing, you have deck guns that are hidden to look like uh, uh, lifeboats. And when the U-boat uh, surfaces and points a deck gun at you, you say, oh no, and then you whip off the covers from the deck guns. And say, <laughs> so the U-boats responded by no longer surfacing and just torpedoing any vessels that they came across because it was safer for them to do that, right? And it still, it retains that, that position of strategic threat that they need to put pressure on the Allies. And the Q-ships kind of, it changed the, the nature of the naval war and it made it a little bit nastier because now you have these sort of competing deceptions where you're trying to trick the U-boats into surfacing and the U-boats are trying to get the, the, the merchant ships in the sea lanes that they can freely torpedo them and then escape. Because right? the problem is, as a submersible, you've only got maybe 10 hours of, of air under the water, you have to surface all the time. And you move very slowly when you're underwater. So as soon as you know where there is a U-boat, you're basically going to sink it if you've got a destroyer anywhere within 200, 200 miles of it. It'll just radio it in, they'll go find it, and they'll pull it out. Uh, it was not a good thing to be a U-boat in the First World War. It probably sucked in that. Um, unrestricted naval warfare uh, happened in 1917 when the Germans basically said, the gloves are off, we're going to see anything we come across, we're not going to try to surface or do anything, you boats can shoot anything that floats. Uh, and this was a, a pretty desperate action in 1917 when the Germans were pretty clear that they, they, at this point, were being outspent, they were losing soldiers more rapidly than the Allies were, and they couldn't replace them, right? So they were they're starting to see strategically that not only are they uh, currently in strategically very weak positions, but the future of their position is also threatened because there's just not enough men. They don't have the ability to replace them. So they, they want to sink as much material as they possibly can. They want to prevent the United States from getting into the war. Uh, and the problem with that is under certain submarine warfare, if you're just shooting any merchant ship you come across and you're not checking what nationality they are, you start sinking American ships. And this makes Americans pretty angry because you shouldn't be murdering Americans. We're not even involved in the war, right? Um, so again, that's just a sort of a microcosm where we can, we can parse it in terms of strategy by understanding positions of strength, 
positions of weakness, the novelty of threats, and the sort of the complicated game that you can get into when you, again, are having to assess this at a strategic and a tactical level, right? Um, so, trenches obviously characterize the First World War probably more than anything else, at least on the Western Front. And trying to break the stalemate led to a lot of the rapid development of, of novel ideas and novel weapons. Uh, so gas warfare was first used by the Germans. And the thing was that gas warfare was really good at breaking through the first line of trenches. But nobody had those one line of trenches. And after you've gassed a certain area, you can't actually go in there. So it works for area denial, and it works to, to prevent um, like troops from getting out of their dugouts after the shelling. But then you also can't go there, so it's, it's, you're limited in your ability to, to uh, exploit that breakthrough. Uh, and also, you know, the wind sometimes blows a different direction. And now your guys are dying to mustard gas rather than the other guys, right? So they tried to uh, poison gas. It wasn't necessarily banned because it was like really more inhuman than anything else anybody's doing to each other, but it's not very effective, and neither side really wants to invest much in using it because it's a waste of resources after they both used it a couple times. Um, they try to do things like uh, uh, punching through using tanks. So by 1917, they've invented uh, really crude tanks, and they, they use them to just kind of crush through barbed wire and go over there's, there's really complicated uh, technical patterns of artillery firing that they kind of go through. And part of the problem is <coughs> trenches aren't just, they're not just slits dug into the ground. They're covered in slopes, they have uh, glasses, they have barbed wire lines in front. And part of what artillery is supposed to do is uh, break the barbed wire. So your infantry can just go straight forward. And this involves doing math and testing. How many heavy shells does it take to break how many feet of barbed wire? And you do all that math and you come up with this absolutely obscene number of shells that you need even to make a modest impact. And there's a shell shortage after 1915 because they fired all the shells that they had had, that they had, they had spent in peacetime building, and now they need to rapidly replace all of those. So especially the British Expeditionary Force is constantly short on shells. They do not have enough to, to make an effective uh, breakthrough, and this is just a limitation of their industrial capacity. There's no way to make this faster. And they try everything they possibly can. And that's a, a supply bottleneck that they have during the entire war, right? And that constraint leads them to make some interesting decisions. So rather than having kind of like days long artillery barrages, they're trying to be very precise about it. And this means that they're sending more planes up to take more pictures and make better maps so they can know the better positions so that they can use the shells that they do have to their maximum effect. But the problem is the Germans can camouflage things, they can put tree, uh, tree limbs out that look like guns, they can move their artillery all around, they can get more uh, anti-aircraft guns, uh, and they can also shoot down the scouts uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, so Verdun. Verdun is another kind of emblematic uh, idea of the First World War. And this was, <coughs> Verdun is a really interesting example of, I think, a provocation in war. Because Verdun, Verdun was chosen not only because it was at the point of a salient, you may know what a salient is, right? If you've got a line, two lines, a salient is a bump in the line, okay. right? So if you are on this side, you can have multiple uh, directions of fire going into one area. So Verdun was you know, a little pocket like this, a salient. But more importantly, Verdun was a place where the French had an enormous national pride in. And the Germans knew that if we can, if we can lure them to trap themselves in Verdun, in this pocket, we can just blast the ever-loving hell out of them, and we'll kill way more French than we'll lose Germans by doing this, right? And this is the start of what we call attritional warfare. And attritional warfare is a particularly cold, uh, cold-blooded, kind of math-based version of warfare. And the idea was that the French are going to be so committed to making ruinous attacks to retake uh, Verdun that they will break themselves in their own fortress, right? And this worked for like a month. And then the French started catching up because the Germans start running out of shells. And the Germans start losing air battles above Verdun. And the Germans start losing um, morale and cohesion from their frontline units, and eventually by the end of the Battle of Verdun, which more or less lasts until the end of the war, uh, the Germans have actually achieved casualty parity with the French. So even though it started really well, uh, by the end it, it wasted more German lives than it saved. Uh, it was more or less a bad idea. But at the start you can see the logic of it, right? You can see the, the intuitive sense of strength and weakness, right? We're, we're trapping the French into their position where they feel the strongest, but they're in obviously a tactically weak position because they are surrounded on three sides by the Germans who can shell them at will. 
but they are completely unwilling to let that go because of national pride and because of things that actually have nothing really to do with war, even though they have everything to do with war, because you're, you're again, convincing your opponent to put themselves into a position where it's easier to kill them, right? And this is, I think, a really great example of something that is strategically a provocation, right? You're forcing them to do it because of, of, of whatever, right? I know that Nate hates getting hit in the knee, so I'm going to swipe at his knee all the time because I know it'll make him make a reckless attack and I can hit him, right? That kind of thing. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is what's called the Kaiser Schlacht. And this is another example, I think, of uh, sort of a tactical expression of a strategic sense of uh, threat, a looming threat, right? So by 1917, the Germans are, they see the writing on the wall, they know that they're, that materially, they're not going to be able to keep up with the Allies for a long time, and worse, they know that uh, Americans are imminent to arrive on the battlefield. So in the spring of 1917, the Germans decide, in the spring of 1918, sorry, they decide to have what they call the Kaiserschlag, the spring offensive. So they decide to put all of their chips into one uh, attack to break through the British line, to get the British out of the war before Americans arrive, and then force uh, a negotiated peace with France. Um, you can see this repeat in the Battle of the Bulge in the Second World War, the same kind of idea that ends the same thing. Um, but I'm talking about all of this as if like it's really easy to kind of organize and prepare for things like this. Um, but the problem is that if you're trying to prepare for a massive breakthrough, the things that you have to do is to prepare for that. Like you need shells, you need medical supplies, you need bullets, you need guys, you need trains, you need trucks, you need uh, horses to exploit the breakthrough. You need all this stuff, and you need to be like close to where things are happening, and that's observable. That has a long tail. Right? And if you have scout planes up in the air all the time, they can see the number of trucks, and it's literally part of the job. Part of the job of the photographic guys is to count the number of trucks. They, they can see the stuff in such detail that they know if a truck is empty or full. Um, just through kind of photogra uh, photographic interpretive tricks, they, they know like the direction of the light, they know if they're looking at a dugout versus a trench, they know if they're looking at a false trench, or, you know, there's a lot you can do with aerial photography. So trying to prepare for something like a big, huge surprise attack is actually really difficult relies on a lot of very, very careful planning and coordination and inception. And part of the way they did this was by uh, over-investing in the air war. They basically got Rick Tobin to, Rick Tobin himself designed uh, new <coughs> fighter squadrons whose job it was to just go kill enemy pilots. Like that was their job. It wasn't even just to shoot down planes, because by this point the, the Germans know that the British would build more, even though the British actually had a lot of problems with building airplanes all, all throughout the war. Um, but if you kill their pilots, and if you uh, kill their, the, the supply, uh, the mechanics and stuff that take care of the planes, uh, they won't be able to get any planes up in the air, and you can keep this all secret because you're essentially blinding the scouts of, of your opponents. So this started months before the Kaiser Schlag, uh, and the Germans were actually at night building airfields uh, that they knew they would need because you've got airfields 20, 20 miles back that way, but on day one of the plane offensive, the Germans are supposed to be another 18 miles in past the British lines. So they need to prepare these airfields. So um, guys like Rick Hoffman would take off from one airfield, fly around, shoot down as many planes as they possibly could, and land at a totally different one, where everything from their other airfields had been trucked over. Right? So these are massively complicated things, and these are all observable. And even if you can't see it from the air, you have spies, and you've got spies in French and Belgian villages who are, who are like sending reports back to the British, and they're saying there's a lot of trucks coming through here. Right? And you can start getting a sense of, um, the British High Command knew something was going to happen. They didn't know exactly what it was, but they knew something was going to happen, right? And the, I think another kind of valuable thing to take away from this stuff to think about in terms of fencing is the idea that assaults need to be prepared. And preparing an assault is invisible. It gives your opponent information, right? So if I, if I want to attack Nate from here, right, but I'm, I'm far, far away, I can't actually hit him. If I move my foot up this way, well, now I am a little close. But that's observable. So he knows I'm going to try to attack him, which is probably not a surprise for fencing, right? But um, having the, the wherewithal when you're fencing to understand that your preparation actions are observable and give your opponent something to think about and counter, if they respond to it, that means that they're listening to you. And if they're listening to you, that means that you can use the five words to beat them. You don't just need to like parry, 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 parry until they get tired and hit them. That's not fencing. Right? Fencing is parity. Fencing is something. If somebody's listening to you, they understand what you're doing, they understand that you're preparing an assault, you're developing an attack. 
uh, this is another Clausewitz term for the development of an attack, right? It means getting supplies and men and stuff in the right place to exploit the expected after effects of a successful attack, right? And this is very different than the idea of the characterization, the cartoon we have of the First World War, which is just like somebody blows a whistle and 100,000 guys go and die to machine gun fire. That's never what's going on. There's always something deeper happening, uh, even at the, the most like horrific kind of cold-blooded attritional battles that are going on in the First World War. So I don't want to prattle on too much longer. Um, I could obviously keep going <laughs> for a really long time. So if you find me any time after this and want to talk more about war, let me know. Um, so all of this, I hope this was all kind of useful and not just rambly. It felt pretty rambly. But systems, like the five words, are meant to simplify the analysis of emergent events, right? It means that if you understand this stuff intuitively enough, you don't have to think about it. Uh, it's more useful, the five words are actually more useful as a sort of a post-fight analysis tool than they are for something that you're doing at the time. Because if you're if you're you're standing there and somebody's attacking you, you're thinking, aha, okay, all I need to do is move here, and then I'll be in a position of strength and a higher position of strength. And by that time, you're already hit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you have to just do this enough and keep this enough in mind that it becomes second nature. It becomes something you don't think about. It becomes something that becomes almost invisible, right? Because Clausewitz is talking about this stuff, but he's not doing. He's not. He's not saying, whoa, back in my day, Johannes Lichtenauer taught me how to think about war. That's not what he's doing, but he's still using the same concepts in almost exactly the same way that Lichtenauer does to make sense of the history of war. And we can, we can take the history of war and we can kind of apply it back to fencing and we can take ideas that don't seem, they don't seem useful uh, at first and we can start thinking about making our fencing more dynamic and more interesting and more artful because we are accounting for all of these little variables, right? Um, Fencing and warfare obviously both involve a lot of novelty, right? A lot of what we talked about in the First World War was this sort of arms race, right? Um, if you can invent something that is that your opponent is totally unprepared for, that's going to give you a very temporary advantage, a very temporary advantage, right? So the Germans figured out how to strap a machine gun to a plane. They shot down every British scout in the sky, and then a couple months later, the French and the British were both like, well, we figured out how to put machine guns in our planes too, so we're back to parity, right? And this is sort of like if you're a rake defense and you get to a position of the game, and then you stand there thinking, ha ha, what a beautiful game. I've done it. Now all I need to do is hit my opponent. And if you stand there admiring it, you're going to get hit, because the situation is going to change like that. Right? You, can't, you have to use that, that advantage instantly. Right? And that's where we get this sort of simultaneity idea of indents. Right? Whereas indents isn't, I don't think it should be discussed as like, you do an action in DES. In DES is something that you're doing all the time. Because in DES is just movement to advantage. It's just making sure that you're taking advantage of every situation that you're in the moment that advantage appears. Because you don't have the time to sit there and admire yourself. You have to just do it. And because you have to do things more or less thoughtlessly, the five words become a better analytical tool afterward to, to think about, OK, what did I do this time? What can I do better next time? How can I recognize my position of advantage sooner so that I can act on it sooner? And if you think about this often enough, and if you let this infect your brain often enough, you'll be thinking about it when you play on Shota. You'll be thinking about it when you're watching movies. You'll be thinking about it when you're moving through traffic. And you're thinking, aha, I can change lanes now because I'm ahead. Right? And I'm not kidding. Like, this is, this is, it's in there. I cannot get it out of my brain. I'm never going to be able to understand any other system of fencing because I'm always going to understand it in terms of the five words. Right? I can explain various different attitudes about tempo to you, but it's always going to come down to it's a slightly different take on, on four and knock. And understanding four and knock, I think, makes understanding tempo easier. But they're not the same. The ideas are slightly different. And if you want to talk more about that kind of stuff, again, find me afterward. I'll talk about theory all day. <coughs> my voice great. I also think that studying the five words through warfare enriches my understanding of the philosophy and it enriches my understanding of fencing. Because now I have a deeper pool of anecdotal evidence that I can use to understand my own actions, or understand my opponent's actions, right? If I can understand that everybody trying to attack me is going to visibly prepare for it, then I can know what that looks like and I can respond to it intelligently. And I know that if, if my opponent is preparing their assault, or they're developing their attack on me, and they see me respond and change, well, I have a ton of information about my opponent now because I know that they're paying attention to me. And that means I'm going to be able to use all of the tools at my disposal rather than straight parry, straight parry, straight parry thrust. Right? Because 
if you're fencing somebody who doesn't know how to fence, that's all you ever need to do. That's it. Cut, parry, cut, parry, thrust. That's it. You're going to do that all day. It'd be easy. But that's not fun. It's not art. It's not really deep or complex. It doesn't really involve a lot of analysis or anything like that. But when you're fencing somebody who is a fencer, who is artful, who does understand the advantages and uses them, it's a totally different experience. And it's, even though I've just spent an hour and a half talking about war, I, I, I don't have any interest in like, in, in marking martial violence, right? I'm interested in this as an art. And I can understand the First World War also as an expression of the art of war, even with acknowledging the fact that it was one of the worst atrocities to ever be inflicted on humanity by humanity, right? It's awful. And we don't need, we don't need to glorify that to understand it. We don't need to, uh, studying it isn't necessarily glorifying. Right? And trying to use it to understand our fencing isn't necessarily saying we should all go to war all the time. Uh, but I know it's hard to separate kind of fencing and warfare. The, the ideas and masculinity all kind of enmeshed in everything. And again, if you want to talk about that, let me know. Um, any questions? Yeah? Um, would you say, from a military perspective, is threat a subset of weakness? Does that question make sense? The question does make sense. It's easier to separate threat and strength in fencing than it is in warfare. Right? Because I think that a lot of a lot of what we discussed as examples of weakness are also just different vectors of threat. Right? So the example we had of like a higher position up on a hill, they're up there that don't have cannons, but you have cannons. Technically what you're doing is threatening them to you're forcing them to move because you have a superior position of threat, even from a weak position. Um, it's easier to separate in fencing, so something like a clearing, right? I cut somebody, they carry like this, my sword's over here, and I've got enough room that I can just kind of reverse my hands, right? I can still hit them from a position of weakness, but I can only do that from a very particular geometric framework. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I'm in a very weak position, structurally. I, have, I cannot influence their sword at all. I'm just following where they push mine, but I can still threaten around them, right? So with warfare, some, sometimes the, the strength and threat get a little bit enmeshed. And this is why Clausewitz wrote a book that's like 700 pages long about it. Because again, once you're forced to deal with something that isn't just two people, relatively in parity, things become enormously complicated, as you can imagine. But in terms of fencing, I wouldn't say that they're a subset. In terms of warfare, I think there's a lot more in it. Can we, can, can we disentangle uh, weakness and disadvantage a little bit? Because there's going to be advantages and disadvantages and strength and advantages. Correct. There are some times that being weak is an advantage. So the, the reason I, I zeroed in on strength first is just because strength is the easier thing to understand when you have it. It's, it's easy to know if you're strong or not. And if you know that you're weak, you can make intelligent, threatening actions from that position of weakness. But you have to know that you're weak to be able to make those choices. right? So I know I can do, do a clear because I recognize I'm in a position of strength. Whereas if I think that I'm in a position of strength, I'm going to do something that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, if I try to thrust from this position, I'm just going to thrust the air. But if I recognize I'm in a weak position, I can go to the declaring and I can hit them, right? And I'm not going to do that unless I recognize the difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can talk later. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah.